Good morning. Welcome to 2024. Welcome to Bear Creek Church. We're so glad you're here. Let's stand. Let's ready to worship the Lord. There's no better place to start the year than in the house of God. Amen. Singing praises to his name. So with everything you got, help us sing. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who singing his praises. Amen. Do me a favor. Take five seconds. Turn around and welcome someone around you. Say, it's so good to see you in the house of God in 2024. We're in the house of God. 
We're in this new year to bless his name. And bless to those who run in him, who place their hope and confidence in Jesus. He won't forsake them. And bless to those who seek his face, who bend their knees to gaze on Jesus they won't be shaken so come on and praise the Lord with me sing if you love his name come on and lift your voice with me he's worthy of all praise he's worthy of all of our praise this is why we worship and blessed are those who walk with him whose hearts are set on pilgrimage with Jesus they'll see his glory moments we're going to keep worshiping the lord and celebrating his goodness his faithfulness 
Uh, there's one that's going to be baptized and, and decided to go public with their faith in Jesus through, through believers' baptism. So why don't we celebrate with them? Let's uh, turn our attention to the screens. Good morning. Happy New Year, everybody. It's so great to be with you. Um, I'm so incredibly excited to get to baptize one of our college students. Uh, her name is Rochelle Hermida. Rochelle, come on down. Uh, we've been so pumped to have her join our college ministry and just to be a part of what the Lord is doing in here. Come right over here. You are good. Uh, she starts school in about a week and a half, her new semester, and so she wanted to get baptized before all of that kicked off. Um, so Rochelle, um, what is your public profession of faith? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. I love that. <laughs> Rochelle, because of your public profession of faith, as Christ is your Savior and obedience to our Lord's command, it is my honor and my privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. I got you. Hey, that is absolutely awesome. It happens over and over and over in the life of our fellowship. God's moving in an incredible way. Uh, hey, I want to welcome you to worship. I want to wel welcome you into a brand new year. Uh, are you accustomed yet to 2020? Four, four is what it is. And so uh, anyway, hey, I only want to interrupt for a moment or two before we uh, worship some more. But, but we've got uh, to celebrate some stuff. First of all, I want to thank you, if you're new to Bear Creek, for being here, for being in this place. We love you, and we want to be your family. And uh, if you'd like to let us know that you're here, there's a welcome slip in the bulletin and fill that out. Drop it off at the welcome desk and you'll get a great, wonderful surprise. So please, uh, please do that. Got to celebrate some stuff. I'm going to do three, two, one, right? Three, two, one. And so uh, we're going to celebrate December, all that God has done in the life of our fellowship in December. Uh, here's number three uh, of three. As you know, we pour out just a lot of generosity in December as a fellowship. This not only meets our needs in ministry in general, but it's, it's a part of the way that we really fund our mission partners. And so we had this uh, just needed goal of, of giving $650,000 in December. Bear Creek, you exceeded that by $100,000. And so praise God for you. Praise God for your, your generosity. Man, thank the Lord for that. Um, so uh, here, is a, here is a number two of three. So number two of three, three. Now two, uh, here's number two. Our Christmas Eve worship experiences were just absolutely incredible. We had the largest attendances in our history at Christmas Eve. Almost 3,500 people a part of Christmas Eve. And we ought to say thank you to the Lord for that. Here is number one, number one of three. We've never experienced a December like this never. It's just been the most amazing thing. We saw 145 salvation responses throughout December. We've never seen it. Listen, that is God. That is God moving in an incredible, that's a supernatural thing to happen for a person to step into, put their faith in Christ. And we've just seen it in such abundant ways in, in December and thank the Lord for that. Hey, and by the way, maybe you're one of those or maybe recently or at some time in the past, you've put your faith in Christ, but you've never followed him in baptism. Uh, in your bulletin, there should be a little card there that it's a baptism card. And so in a few weeks, we're gonna do two Sundays of a baptism celebration, two Sundays. And maybe you're interested in that. Maybe you have some questions about that. Maybe you'd like for somebody to just sort of tell you how that works. Find the baptism card and fill it out. You can drop it in the offering, or you can take it to the welcome desk, and I think there's a text option as well. Why don't you take the next step toward really following Christ, making Him Lord of your life? It'd be the perfect thing to do in a brand new year to really, just to really commit yourself uh, uh, to Him. Well, I want us to worship the Lord now with an offering, so I'm going to ask our ushers to come. If you'll come and be ready, and we're going to bow before the Lord, and what we're doing here is preparing our hearts to offer ourselves. I mean, what is worship? It's not how emotional you get in a song. Worship is how you give yourself uh, to the Lord, and I want you to give yourself. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you for your power in our lives to change us. We surrender ourselves to you. We offer ourselves to you in this moment. And we declare 
You are a good God. You are good to us. Psalm 126 says that you are good and that you do good and you've been faithful and good all of our lives. And we just bless your name for that and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
us, um, I want us just to keep standing and then I want us to enter a time of just significant, really life-changing prayer. I mean, would you open your spirit to that right now? Uh, we're, our, our worship team's gonna sort of just begin leading in a song that's called Good Plans. It's just reminding us of what God promises in Jeremiah 29, 11, that I know the plans. I know the plans I have for you. He's speaking to you. I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. And I wonder if you're willing to believe him for that at the page turn, the chapter turn of this brand new year. I wonder if you have the courage to pray for that. Um, a, part of the, a part of the lyric that's going to come is, I know my father and I know he has a good plan. I have a friend who's been in chemo treatments for a while and he just contracted COVID and he's in MD Anderson right now and it's dangerous. But I believe that God will have a good plan for him through that. I have three close friends that are not, they don't really, they're not friends with each other. I have these three separate close friends and three days this week, I found out each one of them profession, in, in gr great professions, good at their jobs, all three of them laid off, surprisingly laid off this week. They're facing a brand new year uh, after a career's worth of work without a job. That's a hard thing. But I believe that God has a good plan for them. And maybe that's you too. You got a hard thing that you're facing. Man, do you have the courage to put your faith before the Lord and say, God, I'm praying for your good plan in my life. Man, I want you to lay your new year before the Lord over these next few minutes as the worship team sings. May, and, and I want you to make it tangible. I'm gonna encourage you to slip out. The song's long enough, so I wanna encourage you to slip out. And maybe it's even just one single minute, but you would come and kneel. You'd put your knee to the ground and say, my year, I want my year to be yours. And I surrender myself to your good plan in my life. Maybe you wanna come yourself. Maybe you wanna come with your husband or wife. Maybe you wanna bring your teenager, your child with you. Maybe you just want to take a friend by the arm and say, come pray with me. But let's make this a moment that we remember in our journey with the Lord. We're turning a page and we're trusting God for the good plan that he has in our life. And so Eber and the team's going to just begin to sing right now. And I want to invite you, would you come? Would you just come now? And just start kneeling and praying, even if it's just for a minute, just 45 seconds, God, this year is your year for me. Why don't you slip out and come as we sing. The Lord is my shepherd, and he is everything I need. So I will not worry, and I will not fear the enemy. He said that He loves me He said that He's with me Even though I walk through the valley Of shadow and death And still I know He has good plans He has good plans for me So I will take heart in deserts and gardens he has good plans, He has good plans for me. If I know my Father, I know my Father has good plans. He has good plans for us. He's not finished with us yet. Is my savior, so why should I doubt my victory? Why would I question the rod and the staff that comforts me? He quiets the waters, he quiets.
quiets the storm inside of me So what could be better Than walking with Him When I believe He has good plans He has good plans For me So I will take part In visions and gardens He has good plans He has good plans For me If I know my Father I know my Father is He has good plans He has good plans For me So I would take part In deserts and gardens He has good plans He has good plans For me If I know my Father I know my Father is Good plans He has good plans We submit to your plans We submit to your plans You are King You are our King And surely Your goodness And mercy will follow after me So fear will I find me Cause I'll be dwelling in the house of God Surely Your goodness And mercy will follow after me Fear will I find me Cause I'll be dwelling in the house of God Surely Your goodness And mercy will follow after me So fear will I find me Cause I'll be dwelling in the house of God Surely Your goodness Your mercy will follow after me Fear will not find me Cause I'll be dwelling in the house of God He has good plans He has good plans For me So I will take part in deserts and gardens He has good plans He has good plans For me If I know my Father, I know my Father has good plans Good plans Good plans If I know my Father, I know my Father has good plans Good plans Good plans If I know my Father, I know my Father has good plans He has good plans for me He has good plans for us Surely His goodness and His mercy will follow us Every day Every day of this year and of our life. Sing that one more time with me. He has good plans. He has good plans for me. So we will take heart. So I will take heart in deserts and gardens. He has good plans. He has good plans. trust you with the hills that are coming, the deserts that are coming, the gardens that are coming, the low places, the high places that will come in this year. And thank you, God, that through it all, 
you will guide us, that you will shepherd us, that you will make a path, that you will be our strength, God, and that we can have assurance in that, that we can trust you, that we can put our faith completely in someone that will not fail. So God, we submit to your ways and your plans for us because they're, they're bigger, they're greater than anything that we could have for ourselves. So we lay down our agenda for this year. We lay down what we think are our plans for the year, for the year and we submit to you and you alone. We know that that is a place where we will not be shaken. It's in you, Jesus. So we want to do that today. We love you and we thank you you, that we can trust you today. We pray this now in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen Amen and amen. You can be seated in this moment. Yeah, we can celebrate that. Amen. Be seated. obvious that God's presence is uh, all over this place, and we're in his presence, and we're going to let him speak through the word uh, over the moments ahead. So if you're new, if you're new to Bear Creek, uh, I'm beginning a brand new series called Unshakable. If you're old to Bear Creek, I'm, I'm in the eighth message of uh, many messages from Hebrews 11, right? Uh, and so um, uh, that just gives you a little bit of context. Um, for the first four weeks of this year, I just want to challenge you to something new, and, and that is to write a new chapter in your life. I wonder if you would think about this turn in your life as writing a brand new chapter and make that chapter about the essential key that you need in you to to really face and overcome all of the unknown, unexpected, unplanned for, unpredictable things that are going to be in your path this year and in your journey ahead. So, there's always, um, there's kind of a mindset that comes sometimes when someone introduces a message series like this. Brand new year, face a new year, turn the page. And so, so what's the approach going to be? I mean, what's the mindset going to be? And, and I want to already like confront this and I want to kill two mindsets first so that we approach this right. So look, we are not going to approach the next four weeks like this. Are you, I'm giving you an image. Let me show you this image. We're not going to approach this like this. You know, cupcakes are just muffins that believe in miracles. Yeah, I want the image to stick there for a minute because I want you to Listen, look, this is not how you approach the journey that's ahead of you. It is not with meringue optimism, not with light, fluffy optimism that's based on nothing. Not that. Nor do I want us to approach it in the opposite way. Uh, we're not going to approach it with the attitude that says this. You know what? Life is really hard. After all, it kills you, right? I mean, I think that's a famous statement from somebody. I don't know, I don't know but I wouldn't want to hang around with them. You know, because look, look, we're not going to approach it from some sort of stoic 
really cynical, resigned, resigned from really facing life and overcoming. Why? You know, because life's hard and it's going to kill you anyway. Neither of those attitudes. I want us to wash those out of our mindset as we walk through these four weeks. Uh, Because look, look, here's why you need this thing, this unshakable thing that we're going to talk about uh, for the four weeks Here's why you need it. Just look back at your journey. Just look back at at your path, right? Look at it. It's strewn with big and hard and unexpected things, right? I mean, let's just, just for a moment, just for a moment, let's just sort of walk down memory lane for a second. Are you ready? Let's just, so let's think back 10 years. What was going on with us 10 years ago? Uh, So 2014, the oil and gas economy in our community collapsed, and destroyed 80,000 jobs in one fell swoop, and then reverberated in all of those adjacent kind of jobs. Everybody I knew, every person I knew in oil and gas was, cr- was, was, was crunched, was, was, was crumbling under the pressure of that. Uh, did we expect that to happen? Let's keep moving down memory lane. Oh, let's remember 2016. Remember 2016 in April? There was that thing called, you know, the tax day flood where 240 billion gallons of water fell on Cyprus and Barker and Bear Creek and flooded hundreds of homes. And and many of you went through that. It was so Hard. I mean, were we like expecting that on our pathway? Then 2017 came. We breathed this sigh of relief, this collective sigh of relief. Hurricane Harvey is not going to hit the Houston area directly. Phew. But then it spun off the most rain dense storm system, slow moving storm system in the history of America, uh, dropped 50 inches of rain in less than 24 hours. There is no landmass that could, that could handle that and just destroyed so much of our property uh, and, and possessions. And, and we were unexpectedly underwater on our journey. I'll just give you one more, right? I, I can tell I'm depressing you. You're just, you're, you're moving further and further down and you're so, so only one more. Let's just, one more step on memory lane. Do you remember March 2020? Exactly. Exactly. In fact, I have a rule on our staff when we meet. If you're ever going to refer to that, you refer to it as the time that we do not speak of. But look, the, That that, that may have been the hardest thing we've been through in our lifetimes. So hard. And many of you, you lost people you loved. BJ and I did. Uh, Hard. Did we expect that to happen? And so, look, look, and I'm not even taking into account your personal journeys. Uh, you know, the, 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 mom, the moment that broke your heart, uh, the, the unexpected diagnosis, the, the huge mistake you made that now affects everything in your life. And, and look, I'm making the point I've made earlier. I just illustrated it now. I'm making the point. The point is that it takes something way stronger than cupcake optimism. It takes something way more uh, meaningful than just stoic, cynical pessimism about how hard life is in order for you to flourish, in order for you to not crater. And I, listen, I, you, need, you need a kind of resilience that makes you stronger and stronger. You know the definition of resilience. It is that you get knocked down and you get back up again. You get knocked down, you get the stuffing kicked out of you, and you get back up again, and you start the journey again. You need that. And so what's the answer for finding that strength? You need something unshakable in you that keeps growing in you, that makes you stronger and stronger. And does that even exist? The answer is that unshakable thing does exist. And I'm going to show it to you. We're going to expand it for four weeks. And so, and so look, I, I, I'm going to show it to you through case studies. 
Now, this is where I kind of just tell you the structure of the sermon. You know, how, what is this based on? Look, so, so for the first half, I'm, I'm going to give you a review of what we've done, four case studies. And then the second half, I'm going to give you two brand new principles. And, and so look, what is this thing? What is this thing that I, that I need? What is this unshakable thing uh, I need? Well, it's, it comes out of these case studies. Uh, now, they're ancient, but I promise you, they transcend time. Literally hundreds of generations have found their strength in these case studies. And where do they come from? They come from sacred scripture in a, in a list, in a list of overcomers from Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. And that's where we're spending our time. And so let, let me show you case, uh, case study number one. Abel is the first in this case study. And he, and he developed this unshakable thing in him. And how did he do that? Well, he learned to grow his faith through worship. He learned faith by offering his first and his best, the best of his life to God. I mean, that is at the core of it. We did that case study. Faith was learning to offer God your first and best. That's what worship, was, uh, worship is. I mean, he stripped away all of the surface level that worship is the emotion I feel in a really, you know, uh, a really emotional song. It is me offering my best, my first and my best to him. And this unshakable thing grew up in him. Case number number two. Case study number two. Then there was Enoch. And Enoch grew his faith by learning to faithfully walk. He learned to faithfully walk with God every day. And in fact, what we learned about Enoch is then, then, and then one day, after many, many years of walking with God, then one day he went for the walk and he just didn't come back. God took him. And, and, and what we learned is that the formation of his heart was the most important thing to him. What if that happened to you in this new chapter? The new chapter, page you're turning, chapter you're writing, that, that, that for you, for you, the new most important thing in my life is the formation of my heart. It is not to accumulate a big pile of cash. It is not to advance in my career. Those might be important things, but they're not going to be what's at the core of my heart. What is at the core of my being is the formation of who God is creating me to be. And so every day, every day with Enoch, his core desires and pursuits were about how to grow more into the person God wanted him to be. And every day there was a surrender of his desire, his will, his agenda, his ambitions, just to walk faithfully with God. He wanted more than anything to grow into a godly man from the inside out. What if that began to happen in you? If that began to happen in you, I can tell you this unshakable thing, this unshakable thing would grow up in you. There's a third case study, and that was Noah. You remember what we learned about Noah is that he learned to grow his faith by continual obedience. And the way God taught that to him is he said, I want you to build a boat. Let me show you the plans. And he rolls them out. It's going to take 120 years, 120 years working every day to build this boat. He worked on a project that would take 120 years to finish. And that, listen, that daily repetition built his faith into something unshakable. He kept building the boat day after day, and it built a life that believed God. It made him unshakable. That faith built a safe place around him when, so that when the floods came and washed away everything else, he stood that's case, num case study number three. Now let's do case study number four, and it transitions. It transi transitions into the principle for this day. Then there was the case study of Abraham and Sarah. And so um, there are two parts to their story. And we did the first part of their story in the, uh, in the previous uh, case study. They started learning faith this way. The, the beginning of their journey, the beginning of their learning faith was learning by faith to go when God said go. But it was more than that. They learned to go when God said go without needing to know what their future circumstances were going to be. Do you know that is a gigantic step? 
That, okay, God, you're saying, you're saying for me to obey, to obey you in this way. But, but wait, 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 wait. Before I take that step, now tell me, how's it going to go? I mean, you know, is it, am I going to be able to continue to build the pile of cash? And am I going to, you know, have lots of fun? And, and is it going to be easy rather than hard? They didn't know any of that. They were willing to go without the need to know. And it began to build an unshakable thing inside of them. And, 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 and so there is this second part. There's the second part to their case study. Uh, the question is, how did they actually develop that ability? Uh, how did that kind of capacity for trust and, uh, and reliance and dependence on God, how did that actually grow up in them? Okay, here it is. Here, you're, now you're to it. Here it is. This is what you're going to learn today. Here is the power of that unshakable thing in you. Your faith, your faith Growing is more connected to your ability to wait more than any other single thing. It's about your ability and what you do in the waiting. That's how it unfolds in Abraham and Sarah's life. And I want you to see that in Hebrews 11, starting in verse 8. We're going to travel some ground we've been on and then brand new principle, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which uh, he was to receive an inheritance. And here's that former principle. He went out not knowing where he was going. Verse 9, by faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, uh, uh, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Verse 10, for he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now, verse 11, by faith, Sarah, by faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who made the promise. We're going to dig into that principle, and that principle is, go, is going to create the capacity for you to have the unshakable thing in you. And so look, here's the idea. I want you to see it really succinctly. Watch this idea. This is how your faith not just grows. This is how it grows resilient and unshakable. And it grows resilient. It grows unshakable. When you start by just learning these two things, the next two things, here they are. Learn these two things. Number one, just learn this. Start by just learning this. There is a power gained in waiting. I'm not saying it's a great idea to wait and be patient and something good will happen. I'm saying there is a power gained in waiting. And I want you to see it in Abraham and Sarah's life. So um, it, here's, here's a way to see their lives. Their lives is a series of waiting. Abraham and Sarah, I mean, their lives are characterized by a series of waiting. And I'm going to show that to you. Genesis 11, God calls Abraham or Abram at that time, calls him from Ur of the Chaldees to an unknown promised land. So if he lived in the southern Ur of the Chaldees, this entire journey, this journey that God is going to lead him on is over a thousand miles. Uh, and, and as you know, look, look at what is happening there. They're in the southern the southern desert of, of the Middle East. I mean, right, you get, you could saddle up camels and create a caravan. And you know, within 20 miles, you could get lost and die. And this is going to be a journey of a thousand miles, ultimately. But it's, it's, it's punctuated by waiting, uh, waiting times. Waiting time number one, Genesis 11. Uh, uh, Abraham and his family travel over 500 miles on camel or, uh, or on foot. Uh, and, uh, and they stop in Haran. And this suddenly becomes for this unknown period of time. The text even says that he settled there, that his father actually died there. I mean, it implies they're there for a long time. They haven't reached their destination. They don't know where their destination is because God said, I'll show you. But they're in this waiting mode and they're just waiting and waiting. I mean, where is the debt? Where's the promise? Where's the promised land? Where's the destination? We're hanging out here in Haran for a long time. They're waiting for God to say, now keep going this way. Then waiting period number two. In Genesis 12, God leads them to the promised land, to Beth El, 
uh, to what we know as Israel today. And God promises uh, Abraham that his descendants, there's this moment that he says, your descendants, Abraham, are going to be like the stars in the skies, like the sea on the seashore like the sand, the sand on the seashore. Meaning they're they're gonna be so numerous you can't even count them. He's saying that to a man and woman who can't conceive. He's saying that to a man and woman who have no children. But he's making this promise. And not only that, Abraham is 75 and Sarah's about 10 years younger and God is promising, God is promising and so they wait, so they wait. And nine months later, guess what? Nothing happened. And five years later, guess what? Nothing happened. But then 10 years later, guess what? Nothing happened. And then 24 years later, an angel comes and says, next year. They waited on one single promise for 25 years. Think of the waiting That's astounding, absolutely astounding. But then there is a third waiting, and this third waiting is more significant, and actually, I want to show you a longer wait. It's a longer wait uh, for Abraham. It's Genesis 22, and so so their son Isaac is born, and and this precious promise is in their lives, and and scholars think maybe at this point, uh, Isaac is maybe 15 years old or even older. And then God speaks in Genesis 22 to Abraham and says, I want you to offer your son to me as a sacrifice. That's not vague or hard to understand for Abraham. He lived among cultures where human sacrifice were common. I mean, if he is from the Ur of the Chaldees in the south, there are the ziggurats uh, there that, you know, the, the, the archaeological digs show that it's customary for there, for there to be human sacrifice around those ziggurats. He, he, he knew that culture. And the text says, now watch what he does. Go to a mountain that I will show you. And Abraham, it says in the text, he immediately gathered everything necessary. He went to the mountain that God would show him to offer Isaac. And it takes him, here it is, it takes him three days to get there. The longest period of waiting, I think, in Abraham's life ever. Just think of those three nights in the desert where Abraham is trying to fall asleep, knowing what God said he must do. Every minute is like a day. Every hour is like a decade. Every day is like a century, and they arrive. And then, of course, God is faithful to him in this miraculous way. But, but think, think of that waiting time in his life. Uh, so what was God doing? God was expanding something in his life. God was doing something in his life that was creating this resilience that would make him, uh, make him face and overcome anything that was um, uh, on his journey. Why? And so why did God put him through all of that? Here's why. Waiting, this is the principle. Waiting is the exercise of faith. There it is. Waiting is the exercise of faith. And the more you repeat an exercise, what? The stronger it makes you. It's the way, it's the way you build your capacity for trust. In fact, I think it's the only way that a faith can even be observed. I mean, how do I observe faith in you? How would you observe it? How would, I, how would you know if it's happening? I mean, the only way that it can be observed is to be observed in the waiting, that I'm trusting God even though this has not happened. I mean, what is faith if it's not waiting with a sense of expectancy that God will do what he said he would do? Your faith grows stronger. It grows more resilient. It grows unshakable when you learn to wait, trusting in him. But some of you have been waiting on me. When are you going to get to how to, right? Right? You've been thinking that since the first five minutes. Tell me how to. I'm waiting. Okay, you're there now. Here's the how to. How do you faith wait? Right? That's the question. How do you faith wait? Let me give you three quick principles. Number one, don't waste. 
Don't waste the waiting. That's the first principle. How do you faith wait? Don't waste the time. Don't waste the waiting. I mean, let it bring up, listen, what, what do you do when you're waiting? Let it bring up everything in you. Let it bring up all of the anxieties and worries of waiting and, and make you deal with each one of those, the what ifs, all of the what ifs. Get those all out of your system. Go through the process of letting, oh, but what if this happened? What if this happened? Well, I'm, what if this is not gonna, yeah, just let all of that f- flow out of you and deal with it and put those under the promises of God so that you can exercise faith and trust and confidence that I will trust that God keeps his promises no matter how long I wait. Don't waste the waiting. Number two is kind of like it. It's close to it. Number two, don't get impatient. The second principle of faith waiting is don't get impatient. And here's why. You'll mess it up. If you get impatient, you will mess it up. You will do just like Abraham did multiple times in his journey with God. Uh, with God. He got impatient and, and he decided, I'm going to help God out. Always, that is a massive mistake with big consequences. So again, you know, I warned you when a really important principle's coming, I'm warning you. Here comes a really important principle. Here is the primary reason God makes you wait for what is next. Think, think this through. Here is the primary reason God makes you wait for what is next. Here it is, because you're not ready for it yet. That's why. So don't waste the waiting. Grow in the waiting He hasn't done what he said he's going to do because you're not ready for it yet. That's the primary reason. But let me give you the third. Here's the third. That is, don't think waiting is passive. Don't think it's passive. Um, What do you do with the waiting? Grow. Grow in your devotion to him. Get in his presence. Let the waiting make you. Get in his presence every day. Psalm says it's seeking his face. It's his presence. It's expose your life to his presence every day. And how do you do that? Here's how you do it. Open the word. Open the word of God. And let God speak to you through it. Here's how I know I'm talking to somebody who's waiting on God for something. It's a person who never talks to me about the Bible or what the Bible says. And suddenly they're open to their Bible and say, hey, hey, look at this. Look at what, look at the promise God makes right here. Man, man, I love this promise. I know something about you. You're waiting on God for something. Because you've opened the word and you're letting him speak into your life Open the word, but, but how, do you, how do you grow your devotion? Open the word, but also deepen your prayer life because this is what will grow your prayer life beyond the, you know, God, give me, 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 give me. It'll move you way beyond that. Make prayer about experiencing his presence. Make prayer about surrendering your will to his. Make prayer about just seeking to be in a right relationship with him and just be with him. That will grow the unshakable thing in you. And then, and then, and then make your worship about giving yourself. Make your worship about giving yourself to him. There's, there's such, in our generation, there, there's just this thing in worship that we've got to break. It's so hard to break, but it, we've got to break it. So let, let me illustrate it this way. It, this happened about a decade ago. A decade ago, somebody, um, somebody did a word study of all the worship songs being, in, being sung in churches at that time. So a decade ago, all the worship songs being sung, they did a word study, and here's what they found. The most repeated word, the most repeated word in worship songs by far was the word word, me, me. That's got to get broken. Um, The point is that that's got to be turned upside down and that the first word, the primary word, the only word in worship is you, God. It's you. It's about you. It's about who you are. It's about what you do in my life. It's you, God. I mean, the point is Romans 12, 1 tells you how to worship. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. That's worship. Holy, acceptable to the Lord, which is your spiritual act of worship. Make worship about giving yourself to him. Biblically, Look, biblically waiting is not just something we have to do until we get what we want. I mean, if you see waiting that way, it'll, it'll weaken you. I'm waiting on God, and, and what's the purpose? Of, well, look, waiting is just me waiting until, until I get what I want. 
A conversion has to happen. Waiting is a part of the process of becoming who God is crafting me to be. Let me give you the second principle. It'll go faster. So there's not just, it's not only that there's a power to be gained in waiting. There is a power to be gained in waiting, but then, but then there is a focus that gives you the confidence you need. There is a focus in waiting. There is a focus that gives you the confidence that you need, and that's what happens in Sarah's life. It's miraculous. It's incredible what happens in her life. And so verse 11 says, she received the ability to conceive. Now, that's describing an absolute supernatural miracle that happened to her. I mean, it's the raw power of God making something happen that could have never happened on its own. But the question is, why did Sarah conceive? I mean, look at the next word. Since she did something. She conceived why? Since she did something. That word there for since has the force of because, because she did this. I mean, God worked this miracle because Sarah did something. What is it that she did? Because she considered him faithful who promised. And a miracle happened. I mean, okay, I I know, we know at first, Sarah laughed at the prospect of having a baby at 90. You would too. So give her a break. But something supernatural happened started happening in her as she waited. And that supernatural thing is what you need. It's what you need to grow your faith. She just, remember, remember all the waiting cycles that I just described? She just started thinking about all of the waiting cycles that they've been in. Maybe it was, one was five years and maybe the next was 10 years and then there was one that was 24 years and she just started remembering that in all of those waiting times how faithful God had been to them. Time after time, this cycle happened. He promised, then they obeyed and then he delivered. And she's just thinking about, yeah, over and over and over, he promised, we obeyed, he delivered. He promised, we obeyed, he delivered. He promised, we obeyed, he delivered. Well, why don't I do that now? And so verse 11, since she considered him faithful who had promised, there came this day that she said in her, in her heart, I believe that he is a faithful God. I believe he is faithful to his promise. And I'm going to believe this promise. And I'm going to live. I'm going to live like he is being faithful to me. And the pinnacle thing happened in Sarah's life that should happen in your life. She stopped believing in God. And she started believing God. She started believing God. And the supernatural thing happened. The impossible thing happened. At 90, she conceived and had a baby. And I think that's the miracle point in any faith. It's when you can honestly say, I believe the one who promised is faithful. Romans Romans 4 summarizes. Romans 4 summarizes uh, Sarah and Abraham's life. And this, this, I mean, this is like the pinnacle of their life. This is what their whole life taught. Uh, they learned and it taught. And it is, uh, and it is Romans 4, 20 through 21. No belief made them waver concerning the promise of God. And they grew stronger uh, in their faith. But then, but then, uh, verse 21, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That's what waiting does in you. That's the unshakable thing that waiting does in you. It brings you to be fully convinced that God is able to do what he he promised. Uh, That's where the miracle happens. You get a word, a direction, an instruction, a promise from God. And in response, you say, I'm convinced that what God promised, he is able to do, and he does it. Last word. I mean, this is the last thing. I'm going to summarize everything in a single verse of Scripture. And I want you to walk out of here with it, living in you for how you live this afternoon. And take it with you tomorrow in, in what you do on Monday and through the week and for the rest of this year. And it's Psalm 16, 8. This describes everything I've just said to you. It's all compact into one single verse. Psalm 16, 8. I have set the Lord continually before me. 
Because he is at my right hand, I will be unshakable. I will not be shaken. I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I have set the Lord before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Now join me, help me, say it. I have set the Lord before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Now, say it, say it as if you're convinced of it. I have set the Lord before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Now, say it like you absolutely believe it and you know that God, you know that this is who God is. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Absolutely. It's time to pray. Let's bow together. We're in this moment for only a moment. Absolutely. It's the most important moment, I think, of your year. Because this is the moment that you say, God, I'm willing to trust you for the unknown path ahead. And I'm convinced that you're faithful. I'm convinced of it. And I will live convinced that what you've promised, you're able to do. And so I put you continually before me. Because you are at my right hand, I am unshakable. I just want you to pray it. I, I need you to get, listen, give him the hard thing. The hard thing that's there, give it to him. Ask him to be faithful over your life. Ask him to be continually before you in the unknown, unpredictable, unexpected path that's before you. I believe he will do it. God, I pray for that. I pray for it in my life. Make me convinced. Make me convinced that you are a faithful God and what you have promised you are able to do. I put you before me. Because you are at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.